Welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough. Celebrations are starting for our great Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee. The Cotswolds have such strong royal connections from the times of the Saxon kings of Mercia right up to the present day. Ross and I simply could not resist making a short film to document some of those connections and to tell you a little bit about them. We're starting here in Windsor, Her Majesty's very favourite residence. We're going to travel west towards the Cotswolds and see if we can find out why it is that the royal family have such an affection for the Cotswolds. Come with me. In this year of the celebration of an incredible platinum jubilee, we are coming to the end of the Second Elizabethan Age. It only goes to emphasize how lucky my generation is to have lived through the most peaceful, progressive, and comfortable era in the entire history of mankind. When compared to today, the world when Queen Elizabeth II came to the throne is unrecognizable. Summoned unexpectedly to take this extraordinary position as head of state to Great Britain and the Commonwealth, she was young, unprepared, and obviously nervous. It's fair to say that in the following 70 years she's hardly put a foot wrong. The celebrations this year will be numerous, enthusiastic and reported on by every skilled journalist and commentator in the highly overcrowded media world. It would be foolish for us to pretend that we have very much to add to this mass of information. Indeed, I was having a glass of wine with my favourite national treasure, Kirsty Young, just a few days before we started to collate this show, and she told me she had been brought out of her relaxed retirement by the BBC to commentate on the Jubilee celebrations. In such illustrious company, perhaps I should really stay quiet. However, I really don't want to let it all pass entirely without comment. We have looked, therefore, at the remarkable connection between our favourite region of England, the Cotswold Hills, and the nation's leading families, from the times of the Iron Age right up until the present day. Today, Queen Elizabeth's favourite home, and she has several, is Windsor Castle. Despite its forbidding exterior, inside Windsor is extremely comfortable and homely. It's due west of London, and the train that heads in that direction for the Cotswolds passes nearby. J. Arthur Gibbs, in his wonderful book, A Cotswold Village, written around the turn of the 20th century, describes this journey in terms that may go some way to explain why both Elizabeth's older children decided to live in the area. He wrote as follows. London is becoming miserably hot and dusty. Everybody who can get away is rushing off north, south, east and west, some to the seaside, others to pleasant country houses. Who will fly with me westwards to the land of golden sunshine and silvery trout streams, the land of breezy uplands and valleys nestling under limestone hills, where the scream of the railway whistle is seldom heard and the smoke of the factory darkens not the long summer days. Away in the smooth flying Dutchman, past Windsor's glorious towers and Eton's playing fields, past the little village and churchyard where a century and a half ago the famous elegy was written and where hard by those rugged elms that yew trees shade, yet rests the body of the mighty poet, Grey. 
Gibbs describes the journey in full, and the more you read, the more wonderful and tempting his description of his destination becomes. Soon, he is passing the spectacular White Horse at Uffington. It seems he uses a little poetic license here. He claims that from the train, high up on the hill, the old white horse soon appears in view, cut in the velvety turf of the rolling chalk downs. We've come up here onto the top of Uffington Hill to look at this wonderful ancient monument of the white horse. And as you can tell from looking at it behind me, Gibbs was stretching the truth a little when he suggested that from the railway line just over there he was able to see this thing because actually it points up at the sky. It is an extraordinary thing. Why is it that our ancient ancestors would carve a horse a bit like a Picasso that could only be seen from the sky? This mystery has been troubling historians of the area forever. Why would our antecedents create something so spectacular that they would never be able to properly see? A newish theory, which seems to me plausible, is that the white marks were originally the result of a naturally occurring landslip. When the locals first saw the resulting white shape, they saw how much it looked like a horse, and they enhanced it and maintained it. Over the centuries, many a legend and myth has grown up around this great shape. It was thought that King Alfred the Great, born in Wantage nearby and famed for holding a parliament in the area, celebrated his victory over the Danes in the ninth century by having the white horse carved into the hill. Dating techniques have long since shown this to be untrue, although many a local will still stick to the story. The royal connection is certainly mythical, as it was in existence from the Iron Age, the age of the Dubunny tribe. Perhaps it was they who had an extraordinary Picasso-like eye for the shape of a horse. Whilst there have been times, not least in the days of J. Arthur Gibbs, when the horse has fallen into a state of dreadful disrepair, these days the National Trust ensures it remains in excellent nick for anyone able to look at it from above like the local hang gliders, and indeed drone pilots like us. We're leaving Whitehorse Hill now. We're heading west into more familiar territory. We'll be back in the Cotswolds any minute now. Come with me. Now we are really only halfway to our Cotswold destination, but already we are perhaps getting a feeling of why the area was and is so treasured by our country's number one family. For the current royal residence, it would seem reasonable to assume that part of the draw was that they would be living amongst like-minded people. The level of celebrity this family lives with is unlike any other in the entire world. It would be absolutely essential for them to find a place where the locals were good at rising above the fact that they live nearby, but also perhaps share an interest this is horse country, and always has been. Our resident Princess Royal, Princess Anne, is an equestrian Olympian, and back in 1984, she and her then husband, Captain Mark Phillips, established the Festival of British Eventing. The event at her home at Gatcombe Park is now a highlight of the sporting calendar. The 40,000 odd visitors who flock through the gates each year come to watch their favourite riders in action, but there's no doubt they also come knowing they'll see famous faces at their most relaxed, including the Princess Royal herself. An article published in the magazine Cotswold Life in 2010, without a byline so presumably written by the editor, says with admirable clarity and insight, those who know the green valley which runs through the Gatcombe estate will testify to its innate tranquillity. The grass that grows here is the same as any other grass. The slopes up which it climbs are typically Cotswold, and the green of the leaves is much like any other green. But the sum is more than its parts, for there's a different feel to Gatcombe Park, something indefinable that sets it apart. 
I can't resist relating a small story that tells of a disturbance to that tranquillity. In the 1990s, I bought from the farm manager at Gatcombe a wonderful black-and-white Springer Spaniel, painted here by my wife, Pip. We called him Chateau Petrus. OK, a little pretentious, but I was a wine merchant at the time. We left him with said admirable farm manager for 12 months to be trained as a working dog, something I was not qualified to do. It was only afterwards that he told me that dogs are trained with the first syllable of their name, and he had been rather embarrassed to spend a year walking around the estate shouting shat at my dog. Not even remotely unexpectedly, however, the Princess Royal found it quite a joke. Her elder brother and future King of England also has a house in the Cotswolds. His is at Highgrove near Tetbury, where he has established an incredible garden, following all the green principles in which he has strongly believed since long before it became fashionable. It'll be fascinating to see how his habits have to change when he does become king, as there can be no doubt that Highgrove is and has been for a very long time his favourite and much-loved home. Our journey, however, will take us back to the very earliest example of this area's importance. Before the Romans came, the Iron Age Dubani tribe had their main local seat of government and administration, where Sirencester is today. When the Romans invaded, the unwarlike Dubani were pragmatic in their reaction and accepted the Roman dominance along with their traditions and systems. Sirencester became one of the most important Roman settlements in the whole country, mostly run by the indigenous Dubani peoples. Roman remains in this town are still being discovered and probably will be for generations to come. In the year 410, the Romans retreated from this island Britannia had always been a tricky outpost to the Roman Empire, often more trouble than it was worth, and now they were under threat in Rome itself, making it a luxury they could no longer afford. This left it open to invasion by the Angles and Saxons, who wasted no time. Various kingdoms were formed in the middle of the first millennium, but by 700 AD, the kings of Mercia had established themselves as the dominant rulers based, it won't surprise you to hear, in the Cotswolds at Winchcombe. And by about 825 AD, all the kingdoms of Britannia had amalgamated under Mercian leadership. The aforementioned Alfred the Great, he of supposedly white horse fame, came to the throne in 849 AD and was to become one of the greatest leaders of the time. He fought off attacks from the Danes, culminating in a near-decisive victory at Eddington in Wiltshire. When the constant battles between the Danes and the English finally came completely to an end, it was the kings of Wessex, once again part of the Cotswolds, who became dominant, and in 1042, the latest of them, Edward the Confessor, became king of all England. It was he who founded Westminster Abbey, the church in which our own Queen Elizabeth II was the latest in a continuous line of monarchs to be crowned. However, all this came to another grinding halt with the invasion of the Normans in 1066. Imprinted on all school children's minds, the date of 1066 marked a complete change in the way of life in England to reflect French rather than Danish influence. Edward the Confessor's son, Harold, was killed during the invasion, and William the Conqueror took control. He used his gift of land and property to build a highly supportive network of favoured noble families throughout the country, from whom he expected and received largely unquestioning support. This started a tradition of noble support for the monarchy that has continued uninterrupted apart from a brief glitch in the English interregnum after the Civil War, and of course the odd exception. There are some key royal connections in the Cotswold Hills throughout the next thousand years. 
the Normans built castles all over England, Barclay Castle being the most spectacular in the Cotswolds and a place we will revisit in a second. But as the Norman age deteriorated, a civil war broke out between Stephen and Matilda when a line of fortified buildings and castles was built from Wallingford to the Severn River, including in my hometown of Bampton. This amazing illustration by the current owner of what's left of the castle shows how it must have looked. We've also been able to show how the same ground looks now. This castle was almost entirely destroyed in the later 17th century civil war. In 1327, in the middle of the long spell of Plantagenet kings of England, Edward II was murdered in Barclay Castle, on the western edge of the Cotswolds. Some say that he was smothered, others that he was strangled, and yet others that he was skewered with a red-hot poker. Nobody really knows, but it is told that the echoes of his dying screams can be heard to this day around the castle's dungeon on the anniversary of his death. September the 21st is the date, should you be interested in finding out. His tomb is in Gloucester Cathedral. His son and heir, Edward III, was determined to create for him a tomb as spectacular as any to be found in Europe, or indeed anywhere else. The beautiful stone tracery and frankly unique detailed decoration show that he came pretty close to succeeding. The cathedral is an incredible place to visit, and I urge you to have a glance at the film of our visit there. It'll inspire you to visit and see for yourselves. It contains, amongst many treasures, a spectacular cross, which was used in the procession at the coronation of Elizabeth II, and will, I understand, play a role in the Jubilee celebrations this year. Jumping forward 150 years or so, we come, in 1509, to the reign of Henry VIII. This famously prolific marriage addict had a dramatic effect on the whole of England, but perhaps on the area of Oxford and the Cotswolds more than anywhere. His separation from the Roman Catholic Church and the foundation of the Church of England caused dramatic destruction throughout the area. All the great religious institutions were affected and the loss of medieval buildings and church decorations was terrifyingly comprehensive. But perhaps the most important connection he has with the Cotswolds is his last wife, Catherine Parr. Catherine is buried at Sewdley Castle near Winchcombe. She outlived him by about a year and a half, so she survived that terrifying role, um, and she's buried here in this house, in the chapel. They're not particularly keen for us to film there, unfortunately, so we can't uh, show you the, the grave, but I'm sure it's worth a visit. Catherine Parr was, of course, stepmother to Elizabeth I, and she was extremely fond of her. She made sure that her education was brilliant and very much helped develop Elizabeth into the great queen she was to become. Catherine Parr was a very important figure in what happened after Henry VIII had died. This castle has perhaps the strongest of all the royal connections in the Cotswolds. The castle was owned by the Duke of Gloucester, who later became King Richard III, Edward VI, and Thomas Seymour, who was married to Henry VIII's widow, Catherine Parr. Thomas Seymour, who was a handsome but reckless man, had proposed to Queen Elizabeth I before deciding to pursue Catherine Parr, Elizabeth's stepmother. Sewdley Castle became their home. Thomas rebuilt the castle in accordance with his new wife's royal status. Catherine died in childbirth in 1548. There are some strange stories of how her burial place was lost and later discovered. Following her death in 1548, her body was buried in the grounds of Sewdley Castle, but it seems to have disappeared during the Civil War. Her coffin was rediscovered by a local man in 1782, opened and reburied, only for it to be reopened in 1792 and her body reburied again, upside down. Eventually, her body was laid to rest in the mausoleum of Lord Chandos in St Mary's Chapel. 
Sightings of Catherine's ghost in green Tudor attire are reported to this day. After Henry died, his daughter Mary succeeded to the throne and, being a devout Catholic, tried to reverse what she saw as catastrophic changes to the authority of the church in England. It was an extremely difficult time and she was deeply suspicious of her sister Elizabeth, whose religious beliefs were much more closely aligned to their father's. She first imprisoned Elizabeth in the Tower of London and later sent her to Blenheim, a royal Cotswold estate and palace for centuries and a safer prison as you could imagine. Here we are at Blenheim Palace. This estate has been a royal palace since time immemorial, but Elizabeth I had an unfortunate experience here. After her stint in the Tower of London, she was brought here for an entire year and imprisoned in the lodge house of the old palace, which was on the hill just behind me. Her sister Mary was almost paranoid that Elizabeth was plotting to overthrow her. It's probably not true, and certainly Elizabeth denied it, witnessed by the message she scratched in the window of the room in which she was imprisoned, which reads, Much suspected of me, nothing proved can be, quoth Elizabeth, prisoner. The old palace at Blenheim is long gone, demolished by the first Duke of Marlborough, or at least by his wife, so that it didn't interrupt the view from the new palace which now sits so heavily in the countryside. When Mary died, childless, probably of ovarian cancer in 1558, Elizabeth came to the throne, and so started the first Elizabethan age. Elizabeth was famous for what were referred to as her processions. She understood the value of being seen by her subjects all over the country. She used the loyal, noble families everywhere to put her up and look after her in her travels. Now this sounds exciting, but it became something many of her noblemen dreaded. She travelled, like all queens should, with an enormous entourage. Her hosts were expected to foot the bill in its entirety, to feed, house and royally entertain the company. In many cases it brought them close to ruin. There were some in the Cotswolds who tried hard to avoid a visit, but she was insistent. Along with privilege comes responsibility. No king or queen since Elizabeth I has used her noble families quite so brazenly, and it might be reasonable to think that after the acquisition by Queen Victoria of estates in Norfolk and Scotland, there would be no reason for any of them to do so, but circumstances have arisen, even in the 20th century. So here we are, outside the spectacular house of Badminton. We've been very kindly given permission to film here. It's not somewhere you normally have access to. We're standing on the grounds where the badminton horse trials are held. This house was perhaps the last of the houses to look after a member of the royal family for any extended period of time. I will tell you the story. The queen in question was Mary, widow of George V. Born Princess Mary of Teck on May the 26th, 1867 at Kensington Palace in London, her mother, Princess Adelaide of Cambridge, was a granddaughter of King George III and a cousin of Queen Victoria. Her father, Duke Francis of Teck, was the son of Duke Alexander of Württemberg, an area which is now called Baden-Württemberg in southwest Germany. Mary married Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince George, Duke of York, in 1893. Known for her love of art and culture, and her dedication to her role as Queen Consort, Mary oversaw some of the biggest upheavals in the history of the royal family, including the abdication of her son Edward VIII, who, much to her disapproval, gave up the throne to marry American divorcee Wallace Simpson. It was that decision that led to Queen Elizabeth's father, King George VI, becoming king, and ultimately to his daughter's position as Queen Elizabeth II. During the Second World War, Queen Mary's son, King George VI, was extremely concerned for her safety in London, so they needed somewhere for her to stay in the countryside. They decided her niece had the perfect spot. 
Now, many of us will have experienced the arrival of an elderly relative to stay for a while during a time of difficulty. Usually, we welcome the opportunity to help. But if your relative comes with an entire village full of attendants and followers, and then stays for four years, even the most saintly of us might begin to pall slightly. But that is what happened in badminton. When the Duchess of Beaufort, who was Queen Mary's niece, was asked in which part of the great house the Queen had resided, she responded, she lived in all of it. However hard I try, I can find no record of any other complaint. Now that, people, is style with a capital S. The current Duke and Duchess have recently opened the gardens of this magnificent house on a few days a year for all of us to look around. It's a wonderful opportunity and I strongly suggest you have a look at their website, babbingtonestate.com, to find out the days and grab the chance to see, at least from the outside, one of the most spectacular country houses in the country. Right at the end of what used to be a three-mile drive straight from the front of the house and just off the A433 is a lodge building called Worcester Lodge, designed by William Kent and quite possibly his masterpiece. Some of you may remember we came across Kent as a garden designer at Rousham some years ago and I'm delighted to say we will be returning there soon to be shown around by the head gardener. We're very much looking forward to that. It's been an incredible journey, all the way from Windsor, right down the, through the Downs, to the Western Cotswolds. And it's extraordinary to think how strong a relationship all the royal families from ancient times onwards have had with this part of the world. We ended up at Babington. That was a joy. We hope you've enjoyed the trip, and we, in our tiny way, would like to offer Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II our very best wishes for her 70th Jubilee celebrations. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We love your comments under these films, so please leave some and follow us on Instagram. We'll see you again very soon.